Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now if you wanted to save a little bit of money but still wanted to experience some of the highest frame rates possible back in 2011, you might have gone with an i7-2600 as the centerpiece of your gaming rig. With 4 cores and 8 threads it was a great processor for the money, all 294 US dollars worth of it. Fast forward 11 years and we're still seeing the release of quad core processors, albeit with lower launch prices and far more power under the hood. The i3-12100F is a good example. It's almost two and a half times cheaper than the i7 cost at launch, and it's ideal for anyone who wants great performance from the latest games without breaking the bank. This got me wondering how a once high-end chip compares with a modern budget king. As far as CPU power goes, the new i3s are really quite special, but that's not to say the i7 still can't put up a fight. These days, a used 2600 seems to cost about half of a new i3, and it's still a good choice for anyone looking to build a system based on the all-round, low-cost 1155 platform. The i7 system I'm using has 16 gigs of DDR3 installed. That's two 8 gig 1600 MHz modules in dual channel, and the i3 is using 3200 MHz DDR4 in the same configuration. Faster memory is just a natural advantage of the newer 1700 platform, though you might be able to squeeze a little more performance out of both processors with faster memory. I started with an older game today, Bioshock Infinite, simply because it's one of my favourites and I wondered if perhaps the gap between the two chips would be at its closest here. I was wrong. Although the average performance more than doubled with the i3, the i7 still did a good job. The same thing can be said as we move on to the CPU intensive CSGO, this loves a fast processor and while the modern i3 left the top class old school i7 in the dust, it still produced a solid result. Again the 1.1% figures do hint at a less consistent experience but I picked up this CPU for £36 and for that sort of money, well I'm happy. This video is just for a bit of fun and also in a way it celebrates the longevity of the 11 year old i7. Furthermore I think it shows the value of the i3, it's under £100 here in the UK and it can run anything problem free. CSGO will pose no threat and even Cyberpunk will run smoothly, which we'll move on to now. For this test I started off in an emptier part of the city, where the i7 was holding up almost as well as the i3-12100F, but all of a sudden, as we moved into the jam-packed downtown area, I realised that we were in some frame rate related trouble. Now to be fair, the i7 will still provide a somewhat playable experience. The average was still well above 30 FPS, and while there will be some dips below 30, we are running with the high settings and high crowd density enabled. I don't think turning down any of these options will help out too much, but lowering the crowds is probably your best bet. A 2080 Super is also an unrealistic pairing, so performance with a more mid-range card will differ, but as I mentioned, a high-end GPU helps us understand the true potential of both processors here. The i3 isn't completely without fault, I should add, busier parts of town will cause some noticeable frame dips, and there are moments where we hit over 90% CPU usage. Elden Ring has a 60fps cap in place, perhaps because going over this breaks the physics or something, but the i3 will allow us to hit this cap as an average. There were no real issues here at all, even when combat started heating up and I inevitably died many times in a row. The i7 struggles to maintain a solid frame rate, but again, it's not awful. The average is still exceeding 30, but as the screen fills up with merciless enemies and creatures alike, you might start to experience some slowdown that could play havoc with your otherwise sharp reflexes. I'm constantly praising Forza Horizon 5's optimization, and there's no exception here. The i7-2600 put up a very strong fight, exceeding 60fps, and to be honest, the gameplay felt smoother than the figures stated. The 1.1% lows aren't that bad on paper, but they're lower than I thought they would be based on my gameplay experience, if that makes sense. Again, the i3 delivers solid performance in pairing with the 2080 Super. I'm not sure if I'd pair this with such a powerful card either. It may be a bit much, but both components seem to be working great in tandem here, so no complaints. So far though, and while the i3 is demonstrating very good performance for the money, the i7 is sort of doing the same. If I bought one of these a decade ago, and I was still able to use it to play the most 
modern games, well, I'd be very pleased with my investment. Finally, it's Halo Infinite, and I will never understand the way that this game engine works. There were moments whereby the old i7 was matching the i3 performance-wise, hitting over 90 frames per second. It was quite the sight to behold. There were a few more dips and drops every so often though, and after playing through this big team battle, the differences became clearer. But I mean, come on, I think we certainly got our £36 worth of performance here, and then some. Modern i3s will leave decade old flagships in the dust, that goes without saying, but with each generation of new CPU that comes out, said flagships become cheaper and cheaper. And that won't mean that they are any less capable than they were years ago in games that were released years ago. For new releases, the story is a little different, but the 2600 still seems to be doing okay in its own right. So thank you very much for watching then, if you enjoyed this one leave a like, leave a dislike if you didn't, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, let me know if you still use an old i7-2600 down in the comments below of course, and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.